Today is my last uh, sermon for this series. I call this sermon, uh, Encounter the Mentor. And I'll tell you why I said that, Encounter the Mentor. Because last two weeks, we kind of uh, worked on a few things that, you know, um, the first uh, sermon series, we talked about three characters. That is a murderer and also scoffer and worshiper. Remember, God, during this season, saved a murderer. And God, during this season, also opened the doors for people to see the, the things that could happen in a, in a natural life, bad stuff that people are scoffing during this time. And also, the third one, God revealed us through a third thief who was a worshiper. He worshiped God. And, and we learned last week how to surrender or how to control our arguments and our will and how to surrender our control towards the Lord, towards God. And we learned that if you want to know about those two sermons, we have them on our app. You can download them on app. You can watch them or you can listen to them. And we do have a complimentary one-hour Wi-Fi in the building. You're most welcome to go. W T W C. I think, uh, you know, you can click and then there, there you'll see CJC logo. And you can also, you know, uh, have fun with it. And uh, don't watch the movies. Just listen to sermons if you can, for 30, 40 minutes, and um, enjoy, that, uh, enjoy that privilege. Another thing that, you know, I want to do, is, it's coming in my mind, so I just have to let it out so that we can focus on the sermon, that uh, every Sunday, 9 a.m., we do have a Spanish church going on in the next building, and 9.30, students ministry, if you have students that, you know, you want them to have a fun environment, have a good time, we have great teachers, and, you know, we invite you to be part of that. And Spanish service is a great, you know, way to really grow with the Spanish crowd. If you have a, people that only speak Spanish, you know, invite them to 9 o'clock service. And they will definitely enjoy the service. Believe me, it's going to be awesome. Amen. So today is actually Palm Sunday. Two years ago, today was the last week the Lord Jesus lived on the planet Earth. And it's important for us to know that. Can you imagine that you know, and you probably, uh, I don't know, you ever have an idea to even, you know, put in our mind that you, ha you only have a one week to live on the earth. What would you do? And I tell you what I would do. I'll go to Sydney, Australia, and stay in that water, enjoy myself. I said, I don't know what's going to happen. And I'll probably eat biryani every day. If you don't know what biryani is, an Indian delicacy meal. And I believe that when we go to heaven, you might see a Peter. And the left side, when you turn, you will find a biryani as well. But anyway, <laughs> that's just a joke, but that's not in the Bible. But don't look at me like, hey, is it in the Bible? No, it's not in the Bible. I just, just my, <laughs> my opinion and my thing, because I love that stuff. So anyway, so Jesus was going through his last week of his life. You know, he's ready to walk into Jerusalem first time. To surrender to Jerusalem. He came to Jerusalem to do a ministry, but he is coming this time, on this day, to Jerusalem, not to minister Jerusalem, not to judge Jerusalem, not to talk about Jerusalem, but he decided to surrender to Jerusalem. And I've been to, we, me and my wife, we were there on that Jerusalem on the, uh, in the triumph entry. That's what people call triumph entry. That's the area where Jesus first time entered into Jerusalem as a lamb, sitting on a donkey. Can you believe that? You know, Jesus that day said to his disciples in Luke chapter, you know, if you, find, if you look at Luke chapter 16, you find that. He said that day, go find a donkey for me that nobody ever sat on it. Bring the donkey for me. I'm going to sit on the donkey. I'm going to go to the, to the Jerusalem. You know, some people think, that, why would Jesus use the donkey? You know, he could just take a walk because he walked before, right? And then why is so important a donkey? But it's a it's very important component to that is he's fulfilling the prophecy that was spoken 13 year, 100 years ago, almost 80, 800 to 13 year, 100 years ago, a prophet named Zechariah spoke a word that the uh, uh, daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem, the king will come, the righteous one will come on a donkey to you. And he spoke that word. And Jesus was fulfilling that prophecy at the last week. And it's important that, you know, we're all busy going to, you know, in the last week, we know we have last week, we want to go do this, hang out with our family, and do something. But Jesus, other hand, was focusing on fulfilling the prophecy. 
Isn't that amazing? That God is so focused on what he has called to, what he, was, what he was being born to. And that day he walked into Jerusalem as surrendering lamb. You know, that whole day. That, can you imagine? Jesus knew. And I love this scenario. And I'm going to get into this. I love this scenario. Jesus was sitting on the donkey. Disciples have no idea what's going on. Disciples are thinking, whoa, it sounds great. There's a group of people left and right. They're throwing the palms and they're throwing the flowers, they're throwing the garments, they're removing their beautiful garments, throwing before Jesus, Jesus is walking, and the only one man knew what's happening, the rest of the crowd have no clue. The crowd cheered him, Hosanna, not because who Jesus was, the crowd cheered him, Hosanna, because they saw miracles, because the miracles that Jesus did they attracted people. So they shouted, Hosanna, he's the king. He's going to take down the Rome. We're going to have a great time. And they believed in him. But he alone knows what he is up against. Have you ever been to a place, people around you celebrating, but you are going through something? Have you ever been to a place that they don't know what you're going through, but they're having great time? But you alone know something is not right in me. Can you imagine that emotion, that mixed feeling that Jesus was going through? That he's been, he's been drawn by the celebration where he cannot celebrate with the celebration. And he's been pulled away from the conflict that he had to pay price. He had to lay his life down. He's counting the movements. He's counting the days. And he's walking into Jerusalem with a heart cry. Heart cry. And that was this day. That was this day. You talk about people, people of God. That on Sunday, for example, they cheer him. On Friday, they crucified him. People change. God doesn't change. He said to you and I, I am the Lord. I never change. And he said to you and I, I am same yesterday. I am same today. I am same tomorrow. If I say I love you, I love you, I love you. If I say I care for you, I care for you, I care for you, I care for you. If I say I provide you, I provide you, I provide you, I provide you. Isn't that God that a good God for us? That his promises will never fail. He said I'm going to lay my life for all of us. It doesn't matter what emotion is cutting him down. He kept walking down to the triumph way to surrender to Jerusalem. I want to I wanna remind you on this Palm Sunday, think about that. Jesus paid it all for you and I. He gave it all you and I. And I, it makes me sometimes, you know, I sit by myself and cry like a baby. That man, while I was yet sinner, while I was not even, not, my mom and my dad was not even prepared to meet, but Jesus paid a perfect price for me before I came to this earth. Before I even know how to cry, yeah, he paid a price for me. And that shakes my core I'm my being. It doesn't matter what I go through. That knowledge will stabilize my, that knowledge will keep me bold like a lion. It doesn't matter what I lost. It doesn't matter what I will lose. But one thing I know for sure, I will never lose the life that Jesus gave me. That life that came from heaven just for me. I am being saved by the power of Jesus Christ and the blood of the Lamb. And I can shout for the rest of my life. I can praise for the rest of my life. I can say thank you Jesus for the price that you paid for me. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I love it. I love it. <laughs> I don't know how about you, but I just live in this. And I want you to remember this week what Jesus did. Don't focus on what he did not do. Let's focus on what he did. When you focus on what God did not do, we walk in unbelief. When you focus on what he did, you walk in faith. And he said, the just shall live by faith. Yes, there's so many things I asked God. He hasn't done, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on what he did. 
so that I can celebrate. Amen? So I want to show this scripture as, as a serious scripture here in um, 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God's power is available for you and I today. That power is not so that I can do certain things on the earth. The power is for me to live a life that Jesus gave me. That power is that I can walk in a calling that the Lord has given me. The power is I can finish the course. The power is to keep my marriage going right. The power is for not only for my children, my life, my business. Everything I do, I do by the power of God. God gives that power. When God says to love unlovable, you will love by the power of God. When God says to care for others that you don't want to care, by the power of God, you can care for other people. And that's the thesis for today, for this series that I want you to know one thing if you forget anything in this sermon series. I want you to know one thing. God has invested power inside of you. And during this time, you can ask God to reveal that to you so that you can apply into your life and express the power of God. Another scripture that I want to share, share with you from here, I'm going to extract why I call the encounter the mentor um, Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, verse 29 and 30. And it says, take my yoke upon you and watch those three words change my life almost 10 years ago. I read this scripture and when I saw those three words that I highlighted for you, it really shaped me. He said, learn from me. You know, we all are learners. You know, we learn from basketball. We learn from musicians. We learn from greatest painters. We learn from greatest book writers. We learn from people that are escalated in life, businessmen. We learn from financial counselors. We learn constantly in our life, all through our life. But Jesus kind of giving us this invitation to all of us today. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And he goes on to give us the description of his mentorship. He said, for I am, can somebody say I am? That means he's not saying I was. He's not saying I will be. He said I am as of today. As of whenever he says I am, he says today I am gentle, humble in heart. And you will find, I love the word will, you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And it's a great exchange today if we can really look up to this word of God and say, learn from me and, and asking God, God, I want to learn from you. And I decided 10 years ago when I studied the stories, when I, when I look at the scriptures, I always try to learn something, what Jesus did, what his presence did, and what is his silence did, and how his actions, you know, generated a knowledge. The mentors normally will not just give you the stuff that you want to hear. The mentors normally will teach you the stuff that you don't want to hear. Sometimes mentor, mentors, I don't know, you have a mentors or your life. They're not going to tell you the things that will itch your ear. They'll sometimes tell you the things that you, you hate to hear. You, you don't want to hear. But if we want to be mentored by somebody, you have to be willing to surrender to that mentor. But you're trusting that mentorship so that that knowledge of that mentor can transfer over your life life, and you can eventually yield the fruit that you've been looking for. And same way that I learned that when Jesus said, learn from me, that God is saying, I'm also mentoring you. I'm also mentoring you. So when you surrender to Jesus totally, like we learned last week and last before week, he said, I'm going to teach you how I am gentle, how I am humble, and also you will find rest for your souls and for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So I want to take three areas. I know we have only 
35 to 40 minutes, so I cannot give you every situation of the mentorship. But I learned three major things during this season that Jesus went through. And there's so many things to talk about, but three major things that I want to bring it to you. Number one, the quietness. I learned from the Lord how to be quiet in the time, in a right season, because every one of us know one thing, that you can say right thing a wrong time, it will never bring the fruit. You may be right, but the season may be wrong. Or maybe you are wrong in a right season. <laughs> Have you ever found that way? So we can speak like, for example, if somebody's lost their loved one, you can't be going in there you're telling, your husband went to hell. <laughs> you're like, seriously? I just lost my husband. Now you're telling me my husband went to hell. You know, have you ever find? So it's important for us to learn from our Lord Jesus Christ that how did he maneuver, how did he learn to maintain his life in a quietness? I want you to just look at this, you know, and then I will, I'll talk about this if you can. Quietness. <laughs> Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Matthew chapter 26, verse 59 to 60. It says here, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for a false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. And I love the next verse, Matthew chapter 12, I'm at 27, verse 12 to 14. He says, when he was accused by the chief priest and the elders, he gave no answer. Then the pilot asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? And next verse he says, but when Jesus Jesus made no reply. He didn't say anything, any word, not even to a single charge. To the great amazement of the governor. Even the governor was amazed of his countenance and his, uh, you know, um, character that he built, he cultivated. It's interesting for us to know that as Jesus is our mentor, our Lord, you know, he's leading us. To kind of direction that we all can extract some knowledge here. That the chief priests are the ones that are chief in, in the time in Sanhedrin. And the Bible says the whole Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is up to 71 people sometimes will be gathering between where 20 to 71 people will gather. In all the chief priests of Israel, there were another 50 to 60 people. So you can imagine 100 plus people are gathered in one accord against one man. 100 plus people are gathered together just looking to put a false evidence against him. I don't know, you ever been to a situation like that? I don't know, have you ever involved in a situation like that, that there are people that are against you and you're by yourself fighting against them? I know it's hard to, you know, even imagine because we've never been in the situation. I was thinking myself, man, if I would be in that time, if I would be staying in the place of Jesus, if 100 people were accusing me, and 100 people were looking to find a, a point where they could kill me, or put a death, I would just run away from that room. <laughs> I would just take off other direction, go find somewhere, maybe go around the city where they, they can sell some nice guns or something, you know, go buy me a gun, come back, and you say, now you talk to me. I could do that. We could do that because... Is naturally, it comes in our system that we want to fight back. 
when somebody is trying to accuse you, when you're not even worthy to be accused, when somebody is trying to put you down to death, you will fight back. Even our own bodies will fight when the sickness comes to our bodies, when diseases come. So we have that fighting nature in us because of God that we will fight back. But I love this moment, Jesus, that Jesus became the lamb, not was the lion. He could become the lion, but he chose to be the lamb and surrender to everything in quietness. It's so amazing that even Pilate, can you believe Pilate? Pilate was looking like, my God, what's going on with this guy? He's the one, you know, changed the culture. He's the one like preached the gospel and healed the sick. And he says, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? Don't you hear that? Don't you hear that people are talking about you? Don't you hear that they're trying to put you down? They're trying to kill you. And one thing I want you to also notice, they could not find anything in Jesus' life. Can you imagine that? He didn't find, they didn't find nothing to put him to death. And sometimes you will go through situations like this. That you are right, you are absolutely right in areas, and there are people who will misunderstand you. And you have a choice to do this way. You can react to tell them, I am right. I know exactly what I'm doing. You're, you don't understand me, but I am right. You could do that. Or you can say, I am going to follow the mentor. That this is my time that I'm not going to, I'm not going to open my mouth. Because this is a season that I need to shut up. Don't say anything. And I believe... We're going through the season right now. Some of you are probably going through some situations that you, you know you're right, but people are misunderstanding you. You know you're doing right. People are talking about you. You know that it's been hurting you, but again, I want to give you an encouraging word. It doesn't matter what people talk about you. It doesn't matter what people think about you. Don't you focus on that, but focus on the inner man who Christ lives inside of you. You say, Lord, I'm going to follow your path. I'm not going to yield into something that's not of God. I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm going to walk through these walls, and God will bring you out better than what you're going through. Amen. Man, let's give the Lord a hand up. Yes. <clears throat> Because when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no, no answer. I'm like, can you imagine? Like you're standing before a, a policeman, and policeman accused you, right? And you're standing there just to be quiet. But our nature is always want to get out of the problem. But God sometimes leads us into the problem. Because he wants to show to the problem that greater is he in the problem. So I want you to know that when you're going through something, don't walk away, run away. We have a culture that especially, you know, when we see the trouble, we just run away from the trouble. When we see something is not working, we want to change right away. When we see something is not going the direction we want to go, we want to immediately change. You know, we have our families that change husbands. We have families that change wives. We change everything because things don't work it out. But I want to encourage you today. Give God opportunity during this time. Go through it. But the way you're going to go through it, trust on him and you just keep your mouth shut. Even though bigger guys are talking about you, the guys that are over you like a priest or they consider to be the spiritual leaders in the Jerusalem city. The elders are considered to be the politicians in Jerusalem city. And these are the people that rule Jewish people. And they are the one accusing Jesus. But Jesus knew who he was, and he was surrendered to the point. I want you to see the power of the quietness. Why would Jesus adapt this quietness? Why would Jesus embrace this quietness in the time of the trouble? Isaiah talks about it. I bet you the Lord probably learned from Isaiah. He said, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, he says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In other words, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. That means God spoke through a prophet. He said, in repentance and in rest is your salvation. And he goes on to say, in quietness 
and trust is your what? Strength. How many would like to have some strength in the middle of the trouble? So your real strength is when you're quiet in the middle of the trouble. How many times, you know, you and wife and husband arguing, you know, you're trying to be quiet and inside bubbling, uh-uh, don't you say that word. No, no, don't go there. I'm trying to be calm. I'm trying to be quiet. So that's not what Bible talks about. All of a sudden, she presses that button. You like exploded. Like a, all the thing you hold you, bam, come out of it. No, you made a mistake. No, you this, you that. Before you know, it was a big mess. And that's not the quietness the Lord is talking. The quietness is absolute assurance that Jesus put me through this problem. Quietness is, I know I'm going through this, not for my own sake, but God will get the glory through this. I know I may not understand this, but I'm going to keep myself in calm pasture because when I come out of this door, I'm going to be better than I walked into this door. And God will see greater things. Come on, let's give the Lord hand clap. That's kind of quietness. <laughs> quietness. You can be quiet. Yet be spiritual. You can be quiet and it be bold. You can be quiet it be awesome. Can you imagine? He is the lion of tribe of Judah standing in the middle of accusation. He is the alpha and omega standing in the middle of the trouble. He is the first and the last standing in the middle of the trouble. When God made Adam, Jesus was next to Adam. God saw everything through Jesus. Jesus came to existence through God and they became created to be creators and they create heaven and earth the moon and stars bone marrow some blood eyes of people speech languages everything was created by him yet he's standing in the middle of the trouble he knows everything how to escape he knows everything about how to get out of the trouble but he chose to surrender to the trouble not because the trouble is troubling him he's greater than the trouble the standing before the trouble he's about to show the trouble I'm about to come back in a way that never been happened in the city of Jerusalem. I will be born again through my resurrection. I will show my glory because of my quietness that I'm going through. Amen. In quietness and trust is your strength. You want to know real strength? Learn to surrender. The situation. Ask God. There are some, you may have to speak it up, but there are some times you have to be quiet. And this is what I want to give you the point for the application purpose. Come to the cross and embrace the quietness. Embrace the quietness. When you come to the cross, you know, you know that you're right, but Jesus was even Right then myself. Yes, sometimes you go through, when you're trying to love people, they're not loving you back, and you don't have to compare their love. You look upon God, God, I'm going to be faithful in what I'm doing, what you have done on the cross. So I'm going to be quiet, not because of the people. I'm going to be quiet because what you did on the cross. You went through for me. I'm willing to go through this better than what I did in the past. Embrace that quietness. And I, again, the quietness is also a spiritual attribute for you to hear from God. Bible says, be still and then know that I am God. And can you imagine Jesus is feeling his father in the middle of the trouble. He's focusing on his father. Even the people talking. Can you imagine when people, I don't know about you, when every day, every day everybody cheers you, yeah, you're good. You play right, you sing right, oh, you do everything good, and you, you're riding on the cloud of the praises, you're riding on the cloud of joy, celebration, bam, one day, one day everybody looks at you, you're stupid, you're dumb, you can't do nothing. Look at yourself, you broke self. Where all these thoughts are coming. They're talking to you. And all of a sudden you feel like, oh my God, what I'm going through. I have a three and a half years of celebration. People cheer me. People love me. And it's hard 
for a man or woman who's being cheered by the crowd are coming to a house where there is no respect and honor. Because they ride on that cloud, all of a sudden everything falls down. But only the wisdom will keep that person during the time. And Jesus knew what he's supposed to go through. And I want you to come to cross, embrace that quietness. Ask God to teach you this season, especially this week. You might go through something or you may be going through something. But ask God, God, I want to experience that quietness. So that the strength, the real strength will manifest. Do you know, the real strength is not external. The real strength is internal. Everybody looks strong when things are going right. Everybody looks so charming and lively. And things are going good. You can, ha, ha. Looks good. Wait until somebody pulls the bottom. And now... Instead of being on the two legs, now you have to be on one leg trying to balance it out. We all go through those moments. But the real DNA of yourself will come alive when you go through something and see if you're able to stand on the faith that God is calling you. God is not, God is not judging you, but God is also leading you through some things for you to see who you are inside. Who you are inside, you say, yes, God, I trust you. And God will say, I'm not going to pay next two months' bill. You're like, I want to trust you, but, but please help me. And, and, and that's not real trust sometimes. And I go through it. But we all go through it. But we got to cultivate. You should ask God, train me, God. I want to trust you 100%. 100%. I remember when we were in 4412 West Avenue, that one day my wife came. I said, we're short $600 this month, Bill's. You pray fast, do what you got to do. And, and, and she walked away. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm in a, at that moment, I'm in la, la, la. I just had a good service. Yeah, good a soul saved. I'm so excited. I'm in the morning. I'm so joyful. And here the news comes. And my jaw fell. I was like $600. I opened my wallet. I have $3. I said, Lord, I need another $597. <laughs> and God says, are you trusting me? I want to trust you, but not right now. <laughs> you got to do something. Before my landlord calls me, what's up with my rent? <laughs> you know, I was, I was doing it, but, but I ha- after I went through all that drama, I had to bring it together. Yo! You're preaching this stuff. You better do this stuff. If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work in nobody else. So you bring it yourself. So I bring it myself, close my door, kneel down. I say, God, you got to do something. Please help me. <laughs> but but we, when we go through, and you know, the, the mystery about this is, at the end of the, three days later, actually, we, me and my wife, we pray together. Three days later, God gives me word. He said, hey, you did not check this week mail. And guess what? When I checked that mail, there was money sitting when I was going through something. I said money was there, but God did not open it. And he wanted me to trust him so the door can be open. He wants me to trust him. And the money was sitting there. The day she told me we're short of this money, the money was there in the building. But I don't have access to that money. If I were to trust him. You would open that right away. Hey, go check the mail. But I was in La La Land. I have no language to connect to the bottom when I fell. I didn't have a wisdom to keep my ground strong when I fell. And that's what we go through sometimes. One day you have a beautiful day. Next day you may not have a beautiful day. It's okay. That's how the life is. We have a sun and the moon. We have a day and the night. We have a mountain and the valley. But our God is same on the mountain. He's the same on the valley. He's the same on the day. He's the same on the night. All things we got to do is I'm going to maneuver myself and be calm. And go through it. And go through it. The best is yet to come. Go through it. I'm just going to keep my mouth. Just go through it. Go through it. When you don't go through something, don't don't say that, oh, life is going so beautiful. 
Everybody will go through something. Every one of us are up against something. Your neighbor next to you who looks pretty and handsome, dress up nice, right now going through something that you don't even know it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Everybody. But the, but the challenge here is we're going to learn to surrender to God and God trusting and in quietness. Just, just, just you know, Lord, I'm going to learn to trust you this season. So you're going to bring me out through this. The second point that I learned from our Lord Jesus Christ during this time is justice. It's so beautiful to just kind of, you know, learn this justice. But I want you to see this clip and then I will, I'll talk to you about what, what the Lord went through during the time in justice. You know, it's, it's, it's a kind of thing that Jesus teaches us in his presence. At the same time, he's not talking, but we can learn something out of this. Please watch this. At the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So if you look at Matthew chapter 27, 27 verse 19, you see the scripture, it says, While Pilate was sitting on the judge a seat. So he had been given a seat that he can sit on to judge the people, judge the nation. His wife, I love this particular portion, you know, if you're a woman, I want you to know one thing. This woman has been silent in tarred scriptures, but the only one area that's been addressed about this woman's heart, woman's spirituality towards Christ. This woman is married to, uh, to you know, uh, Pilate, and she's definitely a Roman woman. His wife sent him this message. The message was, don't, don't you have anything to do that with that innocent man? For I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. So Pilate, who was in a leadership, he was just doing what is right according to Rome. He was doing what is being given to him. But he didn't even know that who is he dealing with. Sometimes we go through situations that you know they're dealing with you wrongly. You suffering inside like, man, I can't believe so-and-so judging me in a wrong perspective. Even though I did not do that mistake. Even though I'm not deserved to be judged. You're going through those things. And look at how God intervened even in a government through a woman who is willing to surrender to the gospel of God. His wife had an encounter with God in a dream. Have you ever had a boss that you're trying to say, Lord, please touch my boss. He's been brutal. He's not treating me right. I'm not, I'm not even enjoying my company. I'm just tired of my supervisor, my boss. Let me tell you something. If God really hears your voice, if God really knows that it's time to talk to your supervisor, he will talk to the supervisor and the dog and the donkey and the cat. And God knows how to get into people's life just for your sake. When you keep your mind right with God, he will will be your judge on behalf of yourself because God knows how to tap in. Yes, he can talk to anybody, anytime. You never find her 
expression like this. She said, I have struggled. I love the word great deal concerning this man. Because Jesus standing there. I want you to know, this Jesus, when he stands there, he is the perfect judge over Pilate. I want you to see that. When Jesus is standing there, he's a perfect judge over everybody that's looking at him. He's a perfect judge over Barabbas. He's a perfect judge over soldiers. He's a perfect judge over Pilate. He's a perfect judge over Pilate wives. He's a perfect judge over priests and Sanhedrin. Yet the judge was silent. Have you ever find yourself that the judge is silent? And you're going through something. How come God has not done for me? How come God is not opening the door for me? How come, you, I know Lord, you know the perfect judgment. You are the judge. How come I have to go through, how come you're not even opening your mouth and do something about this? There are some times God will lead us. That he will show his silence for you to learn something. That he's teaching us the real justice through this scripture. The real justice is, my friend, that Jesus paid price for Pilate. He is going through that moment not only for Pilate's wife, he's dying for Pilate. You know, have you ever going through a situation that, you know, you don't want to go through, but God will use you as a, as a center point of the situation to save somebody in your circle. They're looking at your behavior. All of a sudden, they're trying to re, you know, visit their life. How come so-and-so could not, did not speak in the middle of the conflict? They're so peaceful and kind and gentle. That will open the door for them to come to the knowledge of God. And they open their hearts. The Bible, you know, does not talk about this, but during the season of Pilate, Pilate realized how Jesus surrendered his life and Pilate one day gave his life to the Lord, not because of his wife, Pilate saw Jesus in the middle of the conflict. And Bible says he was amazed how Jesus handled the pain and conflict. He was amazed. He was amazed. And I want to I want to give you something here. Jesus also taught this during his ministry. Matthew 7, verse 1 and 5. Matthew 7, 1 and 5. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use. See that the way and the measure. Two things I want you to know today. There's a way, there's a measure. The same way you judge, you'll be judged. The measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And he goes on to say, why do you look, uh, and, and I, I want to uh, hold that scripture. I'm going to show you this, this, this scripture and then we'll go there. So he says, do not judge and you too will be judged. And for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. So he's teaching us something. The way you judge, the measure you judge. You know, this is one of my challenging, you know, place that, you know, I, I try to understand the judging part of it. Because we're living in a culture that when, you, when I used to go to the market, there's, by the way, there's a difference between judging and the fruit checking. You know, when I went to market, when, you, when you're trying to buy a bananas or mangoes, you know, my mom taught me you pick up the mango and smell it. If it smells good, that means it's a good fruit, so you can take it home. Otherwise, if it's not smelling good or nice, leave the fruit out there. So even I was taught to judge the fruit from the beginning of my home soul. So we're being taught to, we've been taught from the childhood what is good, what is not good. So it's been embedded in us. So we normally do it this without we even know it. I know everybody knows we should not be judged. Guess what? Everybody here judges constantly something, somebody, some color. We go to watch a movie. We judge right away. Ah, that movie is okay. That's all right. And we go to a movie. Ah, that movie is great. And we judge. So we have this, you know, I don't know if it's a judgment, we're fruit checkers, whatever. But I believe that we have that, that fragrance of judgment in us because our God is judge. We do have that. When you work on some area, when they do certain things and you write over your mind says, how come you don't understand? I mean, come on. Pick it up a little bit, a little couple notches. You can do better than that. What you're doing? You're judging. 
touching other person. So we go through, and during the time, we're trying to listen to the word, and we're trying to say, no, Lord, I don't want to judge. And you say that moment, as soon as you walk out of the door, something will happen, you judge them right away. You leave here, you go across the street, where they sell nice tacos and gorditas, and all the enchiladas, and they, they forget to put the enchilada sauce, and you look at a woman, where is my enchilada sauce? And they did not bring the enchilada sauce. You ate the enchiladas, and you're driving back home, talking to your wife. I can't believe they did not give me enchiladas sauce. You're, you're just judging along the way. You may not know it. We do constantly. So I want to kind of bring it this in a different way. I pray that you take it peacefully in a godly way. It's okay to judge. But there is a method of judgment. It's okay. When you're in authority, when God puts something under you, God is taking you accountable. That's why Pilate was given the place to judge. That's why leaders are in the place to give that. It's okay. But the judgment should not be brutal. And judgment should not be in a way that I'm going to show you. It should not be that way. In a way that God is telling us to judge is this way. He did not say not to judge in a way, but he said in Matthew 7, verse 1 and 5. Look at this way. We all judge, but the way we should be judging is this way. He said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And he goes on to say, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? I, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. So it's okay to help others to bring them out of darkness into marvelous light when you're in marvelous light. If I am smoking and drinking and partying, I can tell somebody don't be smoking and drinking and partying. And that's what we call in a holy way, hypocrite. So it's okay. It's okay to educate people, judge people, help them. But there is a measure. There is a way we got to adapt. Because we can't go over extreme this way and over extreme that way. There is a balance. Remember, Jesus is judging them in a silent way that we don't even know. Only the Son of God knew he was judging there. The measure, the way. <laughs> He says, how can you say to your brother, let me help you to take off your respect. How can you say, hey, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you that the way you're going, the way you're doing is wrong. Let me help you to do right way. If you know the right way, then you can do that help to other neighbor. But if you don't, you cannot. And Jesus even goes to help us to understand. He says, you hypocrite, he says to that person, first this is first thing. The way you're going to judge is this way. First, take the plank out of your own eye. And then, see, watch that. And then you will see better. Yes, I want you to be the judge. Yes, I want you to be the mentor. Yes, I want you to be the leader. Yes, I want you to lead my people. Yes, I want you to be that head. But you cannot see right if you have the plank sitting in our eye. Once we remove the plank, then we can see better. Jesus has a power to judge the pilot. But Jesus knew something, that he is the judge of Pilate. He is the judge of a pilot wife. But he learned to be quiet and walk in the measure, in the way of judgment, knowing that thing one day. Pilot, when I stand up there, you stand before me and you look at me, you will say, Lord, you are the King of Kings, you are the Lord of Lords, you have judged me perfectly. You did not judge me according to your flesh, you judge me according to the Spirit of God. And that's how He wants us to die. <laughs> he goes, You will see it clearly to remove. The speck from your brother's eye. There is a right way of judging. There is a wrong way of judging. And I help, I'm encouraging you to embrace the right way of justice. If I don't do it, I'm not going to ask you to do it. If I don't believe it, I'm not going to ask you to believe it. 
If I don't buy into it, I'm not going to ask you to buy into it. The measure I see, the measure I'm going to help you. The measure I know is right, the measure I'm going to help you to see. That's exactly Jesus said. Paul said, no one could judge me. Why? Paul saw himself in Christ in a full measure. He understood that you can judge me. It will not affect me. You know why? I have passed through all that. You can come to a place in God that even people, when they're judging you, they won't even tap into your heart because you won't be feeling that effects of judgment because you have arrived into a high level of judging, high level of seeing. You know, when you see somebody, I always see, when I, when I look at people, I say, God, if you've been merciful to me, I have no right to not to be merciful to the somebody else. If you've been graceful to me, I have no right to be graceful to somebody else. If you're loving me, God, I have no right to not to love somebody. As the measure I receive, the measure I'm going to pass. If you discipline me with the word of God, I have right to discipline somebody with the word of God. If you're teaching me how to pray, I have right to teach how to pray somebody else. If you're teaching me how to discipline I write to discipline the way I discipline and that's what God is telling us judge not the way that you think we should judge there's another scripture that I want to say to you John 8 15 because we quickly judge people by human standards he goes on to say I pass no one into judgment Jesus is telling us here that we, another translation says, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Jesus is not one judging, no one. And I want to encourage you that if you're going through similar situation, you know, we're trying to, we even notice that in our families, even the children, they're doing something wrong. We can immediately judge them without knowing. Or we can learn, Lord, I'm going to help my son. I'm going to help my daughter the way you're helping me, God. I'm going to pass on the baton. I'm going to pass on this ball that you gave it to me. The measure you did. Sometimes parents could be hard on children when you're not hard on yourself. You make them to wake up 6.30, you're sleeping till 10.30. That is wrong. You can't be judging people like that. You tell them to do right, at the same time you're doing wrong. You tell them not to watch certain shows, but you're watching those. So it's wrong. The measure you've been judged, give it to them. And watch the fruit. It's going to come out better. Right? Amen? Did you understand that? Let's give the Lord hand. I know you did. I know you did. I'm helping you. I'm helping you during this time that God will help us. So... Come to the cross and embrace the justice, the true justice. Learn from God. Learn from the master. How did he judge? There was a point where I never forget the story that Jesus was ministering and one of the disciples ran to Jesus. He said, son of God, the master rabbi, there's the tower fell off on people and the people were dying. People were just left and right falling, dying. Can you imagine if you bring that news to Jesus, you know, if you would be in that shoe, you would be right away taking your phone, calling 911 and calling ambulance and take care of some situation. Yo, somebody, disciples, I want you to go, get the people out there, help them and do all of, that's the right way to do it, a human way to do it. You know what Jesus said? It really surprised me. I thought Jesus would take disciples and go there and help heal people or raise the dead. You know what, that's not what Jesus said. He said, if you don't do what I called, commanded you to do, lest you will die like that. Look at the measuring of judgment. He's a good mentor. He's teaching us something. That it's okay to correct others, but it's not okay to correct others when we're not right. Important thing is, we need to be right in the eyes of God. We need to understand the values of God. Then we can do, we can help, we can bless, we can give other people. So come to the cross and embrace the justice. The last one that I have here is that I want you to watch this clip and then I will finish this up. The third, the third one that I learned from this uh, man who went through this thing is amazing thing that really blessed my heart too. And it really helps you as well if you can watch this clip. Thank you. 
Got the fever his head, they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. If you look at those Matthew chapter 27, 39, 43, it says, Those who passed by hurled insult at him, shaking their heads and saying, Can you imagine on the, on the Palm Sunday, everybody cheer him. On Palm Sunday, everybody was excited about him. But that day, the people that passed him by insults at him, shaking their heads, saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the Son of God. Have you ever been through something Similar to these things. I don't know. You ever been through. I've been through similar situation like this. That uh, sometimes you go through stuff. Then you have to question yourself. Or am I a Christian? Why I'm going through. So he says here. In the same way. The chief priest. The teachers of the law. The elders mocked him. I mocked Jesus. Who is a sinless. Who is absolutely a beautiful son of God who came to do only good, not evil. He healed the sick. Every problem that came to him, he solved it. And in fact, so many people were healed by him. All the people were going through and they may be the part of their questioning. What did happen to this man? Why would this man go through? Have you ever found sometimes that you are a Christian? God blesses you. God gave you a car. God gave you a house. And you have a good job. All of a sudden, things begin to break down. And things are leaving your life. And your family is going. You're going through divorce. You're going through loss. You're going, and people will ask you, what happened to your Christianity? Because we're living in a culture we're easily being judged by what we do and what we are, what we have. As long as we're doing good, people say, oh, yeah, you must be good and God is good with us. But our God, my friend, He's a God even when you're going through the bad times, the good times. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same when you're bleeding. He's the same when you're worshiping. He's the same God. He doesn't matter what situation you're in. He does not change. He's willing to see you go through some things. And He is God. He's going to prove it to you. The same way the priest mocked Him. And the other people say, he saved others. They said, but he cannot save himself. Have you ever found yourself, you pray for people and they got healed, but you're still struggling with the sickness. Have you ever found you pray for somebody, they got the job, but you did not get the job. Have you ever you pray for somebody, they received a miracle, but you're still waiting for a miracle. And there's something that God do through you to other people, and you're waiting, God, how long? Why am I going through this thing? What is going on? And that's the same thing that the Lord was going, save yourself. If you know how to work this out, why don't you work it out for you? But you need to understand about Christianity. It is not God gives the power to, for our own sake. The power of God for other people. The anointing is for other people. I am a Christian. Not only for me. For other people. And that's what Christ did. Demonstrating. He's demonstrating. He's demonstrating. If you're going through something. Let me help you. Don't you question God, number one. Number two, humble your heart and say, God, there is a way that you're going to teach me through this. I'm going to come out so strong, so beautiful, so mighty. Bible says, he endured the cross, but the joy 
that was set before him. So his focus was not on pain. His focus was not on lack. His focus and was not on what people talking about. His focus was on the joy that was set before him. He's so gazing at the future. He forgot the present and he began to walk through that. When you focus on the present, you lose the sight for a future. But when you focus on the future, you will endure the present. Some of us are going through something. And you're probably saying, Lord, I can't go through anymore. Let me help you. See the future. The future for you, my friend, you're going to be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, my friend. The future for you, my friend, greater things have God has invested for you. The, your future is better than today. Than today. Don't you judge God based on your present. Judge God based on your future. There is a brighter future for all of us in the kingdom of God. And God is working through us. For us. He's working through us. The next verse he says, he trusts in God. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. Now if he wants him, but he said, I am the son of God. Do you know, God is rescuing Jesus even when he was on the cross. He was. Let me help you what that means. Thieves, thieves, they could not handle pain. They were screaming out of his lungs. They were unbearable pain. Because they have no purpose for that pain. Their pain is ending. They're going through something they cannot see other side. But son of God is not like that. In the pain, he has a purpose. He's going through this pain. Not because this pain is, will end him. No pain can end him. It doesn't matter what pain I can go through. Because I'm going through for a purpose that I have. For a great glory that I have. I can handle. I can go through it. Because my pain cannot keep me in bondage. My pain cannot make me failure. My pain cannot end my life. I have a purpose. I have a purpose. He trusts in God. And God kept the purpose in his mind. In the middle of the pain, Jesus was able to go through it and come out. The reason I said that, he went through such a brutal crucifixion that mankind cannot imagine. Nobody has ever been crucified like that. That's why Peter even said, I'm not even worthy to die like that. Put me upside down because I can't die like that. Put me upside down. But you notice Jesus came back from life. He never said about anything what he went through. He never said it. He never said it. You know why? When he says it is finished, he really finished right. He finished for you and I, for us to trust in God. So he went through that hour, that moment in trusting God. And I'm asking you today, if you're going through something, if you have pain and sorrow, whatever it might be. Yes, our God is a God of joy, happiness. He gives us a life. There's a gospel, but there's also gospel in pain. Ask God, when you're going through pain, ask God, God, let me see the purpose of this pain. When you see the purpose, the pain will bend their knees before the purpose. As long as you have a purpose in your mind, it doesn't matter what pain you can go through. You will go through the pain. The mother understands this. When he, she has a, two children, she will go get a job. She will get a second job. She'll get a third job. She'll get a fourth job because she has a purpose for the child. She will go through it. For the children, she will go through it because she has a purpose. Trusting God. And I'm asking you to learn to trust Him in pain. Ask Him to reveal to you the purpose. As soon as you see purpose, my friend, you will know the pain will surrender to purpose. You know, we have a, sometimes we talk about pain. 
I guarantee you, the moment when you talk about the purpose, the pain will understand there is a purpose in that pain and the pain will surrender to that purpose. Turn your neighbor and say, I'm going through. I'm going through for a divine purpose. You may not understand it. You're going through a divine purpose. So come to the cross. Embrace the trust in God. Yes, you, got, you are praying, God, remove this pain. But God said, let me reveal the purpose. You said, no, I can't handle this pain. But God said, no, no, my daughter, my son, I am allowing you to see so you can focus on purpose in pain better than in joy. You want to do something when everybody cheers you, it's a good day for you. But nobody cheers you. Can you still do it right? When you're going through something, you can go through with the people. But can you go through by yourself having a purpose in your mind? Because God is in it. And I trust him. I trust him. I have a purpose in this. Purpose in this. If you can bow your heads, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you for letting me to minister the way the Spirit of God put in my heart. I'm praying that God is touching some of us here. And I pray that God is touching every one of us. If we don't, you know, just move for the sake of the moment that I believe that God is in this moment. It's not about my preaching. It's not about presentation. It's about that commitment that comes from our heart. So pure, so alive, so authentic, so real. We're not faking God. We don't want to fake, but we want to be real with God. We want God to be real with us. If you don't know how to be quiet in the middle of the trouble, and you're asking me, Pastor, I want to be that person like my mentor, my Lord. Pray for me. I would like to pray for you. If you're one of those that you're going through a situation that you easily judging people or you can be judged by other people easily. Always people judge you. And you're sitting here. You say, God, I need to go through it. But I have to be like Lord. Think bigger. Talk bigger. And I want to judge people the measure that I've been processed. And if you want me to pray, to use that clean judgment instead of polluted, earthly judgment, I would like to pray for you. And you're here. That you are one of those that you're going through a pain. You may not understand why you're going through a pain. And you even ask God, God, please remove this pain. My body is hurting. My soul is hurting. But you're sitting here. I don't understand why God allows me to go through pain. But I'm here to tell you, my friend, that God is about to reveal a purpose in that pain. And if you're ready to see that purpose, if you're asking me, Pastor, please do pray for me. I want to see a purpose in my pain. Right now, I don't see it, but I want to see it. And I want to surrender. I want to trust my Lord. Even when I'm going through something, I want to see God is bringing me out of this pain so that I can give a testimony. If you want me to pray for you, in any of these three areas that you're going through, if you need me to pray, can I see your hand so that I can remember pray? Thank you. Thank you. All over this room. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. You can put those hands down. We're going to pray. But I want you to just kind of, you know, repeat after me. and don't move around. And this is the moment that you're talking to God, not to me, please. It, it is a God moment. I pray this moment every day that God touch your people, God. Put a seed in their hearts that can shape them to be just like you, God. Shape them. Shape them, God. All of us. If you're here, just, just, just whisper if you can. You don't have to speak loud. You know, we don't want to embarrass you. But if you do not know Jesus and you're sitting here today, I want to invite you to this King of Kings, Lord of Lords. All my preaching is worth nothing. If this moment doesn't happen to you, I pray, I ache as a pastor for you that your soul will be secured in heavenly kingdom. I pray every day, God, save your people. Let the city of San Antonio be filled with the salvation, God. I pray. But today, God, my friend, if you're feeling that drawing from God, I'm not the one doing it, but the Lord Jesus Christ is drawing you to Him. He's willing to embrace you.
more than anybody else. He's willing to take you in as you are. You don't have to be good. You don't have to do right. All you have to acknowledge that Jesus is really a sacrifice for you and I. The Bible says, when we confess with our mouth, believe in our hearts that He is Lord Jesus Christ, died for our sins, He will save you, my friend. So just whisper after me. Say out, oh Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, God. Forgive all my mistakes, all my pain, all my sorrow. Forgive every error that I ever done against you, against me. I believe that you died for me. You have risen for me. Come into this temple. Come into this weaker vessel and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you did that, can you give the Lord a big hand clap? Come on, bless his name. 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 I want to pray. Father, I thank you for those that are willing to go through quiet moments. Especially this week, God. As we meditate on your departure. As we meditate on your last days on the earth. I pray from Monday through Friday. Let every one of us remember the pain you went through. The agony you went through. We're not going through what you went through, God. We thank you for teaching us how to be quiet in the middle of the trouble. Teaching us, God, how to judge righteously. How to bring justice in a right way as your eyes please us. And also, Lord, helping us to trust you even though the pain is increasing. Even though everything is breaking. Help us, God, to trust you alone. We welcome you, God in our lives a brand new way this week as we are celebrating this year of Smita you see this greatly than anything else we're asking you to forgive our mistakes forgive our sins Lord we pray that our leadership our president our members of Congress Lord we pray that you would show our mercy one more time so that God that your will will be done on this land God this is your ear, God. I know you can show judgment, but Lord, we ask you, show the mercy. Touch our leaders, God. Give us a heart to call upon your name because this nation was birthed into your name. This nation came through your word and your power. Help us, God, so that we can see you again. Help us, Lord, so we can trust you again. Lead us. Every leader, every policeman, every every military person, every person that are serving this country, outside this country, we pray you will touch them, you will lead them, God, during this week. That, Father, as you paid a price, a great price for every human soul, every human being, that we will love one another because of you, God. We judge one another as you have judged us. We thank you for the measure of wisdom you're giving all of us we give you the praise we honor you we welcome you we welcome you into our houses on this palm Sunday you are interesting to come to Jerusalem we welcome you Holy Spirit have your way with us God have your way with us God lead us God so we will be humble and we will be teachable and we will know what is good and what is right Help us to do right. In Jesus' name we pray. Can somebody help the Lord? Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap. Bless His name. Bless His name. Amen. 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 First Thursday Experience Passover Communion